Hi everyone, welcome back. In this video, we will begin our discussion of the different types of intermolecular forces. This specific video will focus on dispersion forces. So let's get started. The structure of the particles that compose a substance determines the magnitude of the intermolecular force. that holds that substance together. So remember, we're always establishing structure property relationships. So knowing this helps us to determine if a substance is a solid, liquid, or gas at a given temperature. That's one of our main goals for studying this chapter together. So let's get started. Dispersion forces. These are actually present in all molecules and atoms. And they result from fluctuations in electron distribution within molecules and atoms. Basically, they're a temporary formation of dipole-dipole, or also called as a transient dipole. also known as a transient dipole. They exist, or electrons exist, in a three-dimensional space outside the nucleus called orbitals, which is the probability of finding an electron in that space. So in first semester general chemistry, um, you may have learned about valence bond theory and molecular orbital theory. In addition, you may have started discussing quantum mechanics. And I say may, I know that if you took it at the college I teach at, then yes, you did cover this material. Um, however, everyone covers um, different topics in general chemistry at different points in time. So I do understand that. But basically, let's just simplify it. Um, that when you first learn about electrons, and maybe in grade school, you would have learned that it looks like an onion layer, right? These orbits, but that's not true to form. Actually, they're more like these big clouds um, and valence bond theory, you would have talked about, ooh, an S orbital is spherical in shape and a P orbital is a dumbbell shape. And it's a probability of finding that electron in those clouds. Now, molecular orbital theory, basically what you do is you take those atomic orbitals, and when you make a molecule, you make these brand new molecular orbitals. You have the big electron clouds. And what I want you to get from that is that it's not a static picture. Electrons don't just stay in their one spot all the time. That doesn't happen electrons are constantly moving and they're responding to neighbors nearby. It's really important that you understand that visual there. An example I like to give is the game of tag. My daughter right now is really into playing tag, you're it, okay? So we'll go outside for a walk and all of a sudden she'll sneak up to me and she'll say, tag, you're it. And when she does that, she turns away and she runs in the opposite direction. And then I go chase her and we continue to play this game with one another. And so we're constantly responding to one another's actions, right? That's how you can think of with electrons, right? They're always constantly responding to one another. So dispersion forces are usually associated with nonpolar molecules or monoatomic gases. like those noble gases, right? Now I said at the beginning that they're present in all molecules and atoms, and that is true. Um, however, 
when you're asked uh, to give the intermolecular force for a molecule or you know for a group of molecules you're usually asked for the dominant intermolecular force the strongest one and so when we think of dispersion forces we know they exist in all molecules but for example like water water's dominant intermolecular force is hydrogen bonding and it's the hydrogen bonding and the strength of that particular intermolecular force which gives water such a high boiling point for such a low molecular weight okay so when we think of dispersion forces mainly you're thinking of nonpolar molecules and monoatomic gases because dispersion forces are their strongest intermolecular force now, dispersion forces compared to the other ones we will talk about together are considered the weakest, weakest intermolecular force. And remember, that means low boiling point, low, um, low boiling point, low melting point. So let's look at an example. In this figure shown here, we're looking at helium. And helium has two protons, two neutrons, and two electrons for a neutral atom of helium. Remember that protons and neutrons are located in the nucleus. So you can see the, the nuclei here have two protons and two neutrons in each. And that the electrons, and remember helium also has a 1s orbital, so that's why it's kind of spherical in shape, although it looks a little bit of oblong here. Remember, it's an electron cloud. It's always moving. And the electrons are not always fixed here. Think of looking at these pictures of these orbitals as taking a photograph, right? You take a picture and it's static in that moment. However, Whoever you're taking a picture of, let's say you're taking a picture of a deer in the forest, they're not going to stay permanently in that spot, right? They're going to move on. They're going to go you know, find some more food and find a place to sleep, and it's always moving. You can think of electrons as this way, too. Like, they're always constantly moving around, okay? So, in this case here, we've taken a picture, and it looks like these electrons are on the left side of this orbital cloud, right? And the way we represent that, remember electrons are negative. That's very, very important to remember this here. Electrons are negative. And um, we like to show where that electron density is located at that point in time. And electron density, meaning is it a partial positive or partial negative? We use the lowercase Greek symbol delta here. Say delta negative means partial negative, and that's indicating that the electrons at this point in time are on this side of the helium atom. Therefore, on the opposite side of the helium atom, where there's no electron density, we would indicate that by writing a partial positive or that lowercase delta positive charge, okay? Now, nearby helium atoms are responding to these electrons. So, for example, these electrons over here are attracted to the partial positive charge. And that's because one of the key themes of chemistry, and something to always remember, is that opposite charges are attracted to one another. This will be very important if you go on to take organic chemistry because you're going to learn about a nucleophile, which is electron rich, um, always attacking an electrophile, which is electron poor. It's always opposite charges are attracted to each other. So basically what's happening here, these electrons are moving closer to this side of the helium atom so that it can be close to this partial positive charge in that electron cloud. And same thing goes over here. Right? And so this is referred to as an instantaneous dipole, which induces, and induces a fancy way of saying it creates another instantaneous dipole on a neighboring atom. And then they're attracted to one another in that way. So what we have here, 
this dot 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 um, is an instantaneous dipole moment. A dipole moment is a charge separation. Charge separation, positive and negative there. We represent the dot 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 is the dispersion force. So anytime you're asked to draw an intermolecular force, it's not an actual bond. And so that's why it's not a solid line, but it's rather a dot 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 because it's only an interaction. So this dispersion force is that transient dipole moment. That was created. Now, like I said before, once this picture is taken, these helium atoms are moving on. They're not stuck together. It's only a brief and momentary interaction, and it's a very weak interaction, right? Which means that helium itself, because it has very weak intermolecular forces, has a very low boiling point and exists as a gas at room temperature. Now we want to always talk about the strength of intermolecular forces relative to one another. Um, so the strength of the dispersion force depends on how easily the electron can move um, or polarize, that's the technical term we'll use, in response to an instantaneous or temporary dipole. So let's write that down. The strength of the dispersion force depends on how easily the electrons can move or polarize in response to an instantaneous <laughs> Let me fix that. Or temporary dipole. So polarize is just the scientific term for saying electron movement, right? So if I say something, you know, polarizes easily, then in your mind you can visualize these electrons are moving around. So the two factors that contribute to how easily the electrons can polarize, it really depends on the size or volume of the electron cloud. how big it is, and if we do have a large electron cloud, then that tells us that the intermolecular force, the dispersion force is strong. And the reason why that is, is because the electrons are held less tightly by the nucleus and what charges the nucleus it's positive good opposites attract and therefore polarize more easily So what we're saying here is that if the molecule has these electrons that are far away from the nucleus, remember one of the themes in chemistry 
that opposite charges are attracted to each other. That's really, really important. In fact, I'm going to highlight it. <laughs> so opposite charges are attracted to one another. So if you have electrons that are far away from the nucleus, they're not held on as tightly, which means that they're very influential by neighboring molecules and their electrons. They will move around. And if they're held less tightly by the nucleus and they're able to move around more easily, then they are more likely to have a stronger dispersion force. Okay. So the trend here is, remember, I always like to establish the structure property relationships and distill it down for you all. What's the trend? Okay, so if all variables are constant, the dispersion force or the strength, I should say, the strength of the dispersion force increases with increasing molar mass. And I will abbreviate molar mass as capital M, capital M. So if all the variables are constant and we're looking at nonpolar molecules, um, the strength of the dispersion force increases with increasing molar mass based on the premise that larger molar mass means the, that we have a larger electron cloud, which means that the electrons are held less tightly. They polarize more easily, therefore strengthening those dispersion forces, creating those transient dipoles easier and making them stronger. Now, one of my goals as your professor in second semester general and chemistry course is to have you begin looking at data and to learn how to analyze data because many of you are future scientists and engineers and doctors. So I want you to get comfortable with reading data and extracting out important and relevant and relevant information from that data. So let's look at some data together. <clears throat> so whenever you're looking at a data table or graph, you want to identify everything that it's trying to tell you here and what variables we're comparing, etc. So let's look at the first one together. When we look at this, we see that we have noble gases. We have helium, neon, argon, krypton, and xenon. And what I know about these particular gases is that they are on, they all belong to the group 8A elements on the periodic table. They are the monoatomic gases. So we're looking at atoms here, not just molecules. Right. And I also know from first semester general chemistry, these are nonpolar, which means we just learned their strongest intermolecular force is what? Dispersion. Very good. So just looking at this column alone, we were able to write down a whole lot of information. And that's important. When you look at data, you're like, what information can I grab from this, right? All right, so now what we're looking at here, it looks like we have molar mass in grams per mole and boiling point in Kelvin. Always check out your units as well. So we're comparing the molar mass, and it looks like we even have the atomic radius as well, how big these atoms are. And as we go down this column here, the molar mass is increasing. These atoms are getting heavier. And so this particular data set is comparing the molar mass to the boiling point. We've also discussed um, about how intermolecular forces, the strength can determine the boiling point and melting point and other key properties, right? And so from here, and let's see what trend we can write down or write this down in red. So the trend we get from investigating this data, it looks like as we are increasing 
molar mass, what happens to the boiling point? It also increases, okay? And then we know that boiling point's related to the intermolecular forces. What does that say about the intermolecular forces? As we increase molar mass, that means our boiling point's increasing. That also means our intermolecular forces are increasing. Basically what happens is that these xenon, their electrons, they're easily polarized. So they have stronger intermolecular forces than let's say helium, right? That means they're very attracted to one another. If we have a beaker full of xenon atoms, a closed beaker full of xenon, xenon atoms, they're very attracted to each other. So in order to pull them apart, it would require more energy. So it would need a higher boiling point than let's say the opposite extreme here, which is helium is a very low boiling point. So the stronger the intermolecular force, the higher the boiling point required to pull those atoms apart to go from the liquid to the gas phase. That's all related to its molar mass as well. Okay. All right. Let's look at the bottom graph here and investigate that further. It looks like this one on the y-axis is boiling point in degrees Celsius, and we have molar mass in grams per mole. Okay? Once again, investigating molar mass, boiling point, we know boiling point um, is directly impacted by intermolecular force. What type of substances are we investigating here in this data? We're looking at saturated alkanes. And more specifically, saturated hydrocarbons. All carbons and hydrogens. And also, if you see the little letter N here, N stands for normal straight chain. So these are not only just saturated hydrocarbons, they have no branching. So straight chain. If we were to draw the skeletal structures, pentane would look like this. Hexane, heptane, octane, nonane. Okay. What is the strongest intermolecular force? Excellent. So the strongest intermolecular force is dispersion forces here. And that's because hydrocarbons are nonpolar. Remember that carbon hydrogen bonds um, are nonpolar covalent bonds. And so overall, no matter the symmetry or asymmetry of these types of materials, these saturated alkanes are considered to be nonpolar and therefore their strongest intermolecular dominant force is dispersion forces. So what are some trends we can gather from this data here? Well, it looks like for these saturated hydrocarbon straight chain molecules, as we increase the molar mass, we also see a direct relationship with boiling point. And we know therefore that the intermolecular forces must be increasing. The intermolecular forces are increasing because their electron clouds are bigger, okay? and so they're easily polarized and therefore able to make stronger dispersion force interactions. Remember, it's just an interaction, okay? Now, one last thing before I wrap up here. What about constitutional isomers? What were constitutional isomers? They have the same formula, but different atom to atom attachments. Very good. 
So for example, you have pentane and then you have 2,2-dimethyl propane. These have the same molecular formula, but clearly different structures. And if you were to look up the data, the boiling point for pentane is 36.1 degrees Celsius, whereas the boiling point for 2,2-dimethyl propane is 9.5 degrees Celsius. So even though these two have the same molar mass, they have very different properties and clearly different, not different intermolecular forces, but different strength of intermolecular forces. They both have dispersion forces, that's constant, but some are stronger than the others. And so it looks like based on this data, pentane is stronger. Um, and so yeah, pentane is stronger here. And why do you think that is? Like take a moment to pause and to reflect. Why is that happening here? If you look at the skeletal structure alone, you can imagine that if these pentane molecules were to interact with one another, they would have an easier time interacting and creating closer dispersion forces with one another. Whereas if you look at something like this 2,2-dimethyl protein, propane, it's a little harder to get these molecules close to one another. And so the trend we see here with constitutional isomers is that if you have more surface area, the molecules can interact more and therefore experience stronger intermolecular force interactions. So because pentane has more surface area, those molecules can interact more together and experience stronger intermolecular force interactions. Even though they're both dispersion forces between these molecules, the surface area helps to create a stronger um, transient dipole, dipole moment between multiple molecules in pentane rather than 2,2-dimethyl propane. All right. Thank you all for watching and see you next time.